And so take your Bible, if you would, to the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter number 3, this morning, 2 Timothy chapter number 3, and verse number 10 is where we are going to be, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse number 10 is where we're going to start reading. Again, the thought this morning is the power of a parent's influence, 2 Timothy chapter number 3. If you found verse number 10, if you'll stand out of the um, respect of reading God's word this morning, 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse 10. But thou, this is Paul writing to Timothy, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came upon me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. That from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Let's ask the Lord for his help. Lord, thank you again for uh, your word. Thank you for what it teaches us, what we need to know, and specifically in the area of our family and our relationship to our spouse uh, towards our children, what responsibilities do we have in those areas toward other family members and friends. And certainly, Lord, uh, you give us some warning and some instruction as well about the world around us. How should we respond to them and how are we supposed to reflect you to the world in which we uh, are living? And I pray that you'd help us to do just that. Would you please help us this morning now as we look into your word? Help us those of us who are parents or grandparents or even aunts and uncles, those who have some bit of an influence in our children's lives, help us please to understand the importance of that and what your word has to say and we'll be grateful. And Lord, where we fall short, where we're lacking, help us please to fall in line. We'll be grateful and we ask it this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Well, I think as parents, I'm going to go down and get my little controller so I can flip the slide when I need to. Um, but as parents, we understand the importance of what we would call in our church a dedication service, right? We, we have like a baby dedication service and, and parents who uh, have just maybe had some, some little ones born or they've never dedicated their, their child to the Lord... Uh, you know, they come up here and we ooh and ah at the beauty, the little little blessing that is held there by the either the mom or the dad, and and uh, we certainly uh, pray for that little one that they would be saved at an early age and that they would follow the Lord with their life, and we pray for those parents and. What I try to say before a baby dedication service is it's not as much about the child as it is about those parents. Those parents are dedicating themselves to raise that little one that God has given to them in, in God's blessing and, in, and with God's hand. And, and certainly we as a church would stand beside them with that and, and along with them. And we want them to do that. And we understand the importance of, of doing that, especially in the day and time in which we live. By the way, sometimes we say that, and, and I know I, I say that uh, regularly in the day and time in which we live. But you understand, living by Bible principles is important in every stage of life. It doesn't matter if we were, you know, some of you want to go back to the 50s and the 40s. You're never going to do that, all right? So just deal with it. But the day and time in which we live, you still need the Bible. Um, you, you still need to live a godly influence. And by the way, we should be. Uh, I never see in the Bible where God says, well, if, if the society around you isn't helping you and if they're not supportive of it, then I guess you can just stop and, you know, kind of do whatever you want to do. No. Instead of complaining about it, why don't we just live the life that we're supposed to live and be a salt and light in this world in which we live? Let's try to be an influence rather than, Oh man, here we go, woe is me, another person that doesn't like the church, doesn't like the Bible. Uh, I don't know about you, but if I've read my Bible correctly, uh, that has started basically since the Garden of Eden. Where people began to um, question what God has said and to begin to go their own way. It's not just in 2019, uh, for some of you, I want you to understand, it was there in 1950, 1940. 
It was there in 1830s. I mean, it's just, it's been there since the very foundation of time. So regardless then of the, the parents of a child, and that's kind of where our focus is for, for this bit of the message in this series on the home and the family and, and child rearing and, and uh, uh, husband and wife and all those things, regardless of the, the parents of the child being Christian or not, what I want us to understand is that that child, again, whether they're brought up in a Christian home or whether they're brought up in a godless home, that child is being influenced by the people and specifically by the adults around them that are in their life. There will be an influence taking place in the life of that child. There, there's no magic formula in the dedication part of a service, the kind of what we described before. There's no, I'm not praying a secret prayer, prayer that God has given me that, uh, well, that's really going to be answered and all the problems will be solved and that child, boy, they'll just turn out like, blessed little angels, <laughs> No, that's not what takes place. The, the dedication part of the service and, and what our prayer is, is that the influence that that child receives, the decision that those parents make to, to lead that child in the ways of the Lord, to, to give the gospel to them relentlessly, I mean just time after time and day after day and living out the gospel in front of them, that's a decision that those parents are having to make. Now, in, a, in an unchristian or non-Christian home, I want you to understand, those parents are making a decision also. They're making a decision to raise that child either in their own way or to listen to the way of somebody else, what somebody else who they think is some authority in the matter, what they have to say about that. Um, well, just in our time period, we understand there's a little book you can go down to Barnes & Noble or any bookstore, uh, Dr. Spock, and we're not talking the Star Trek, uh, Live Long and Prosper Spock. We're talking about an actual psychologist came out with this book about raising children and all that. And I mean, it's, it's a bestseller. It's been so for, for many, many years. But those parents are making that decision to trust in a doctor, a, another human, to give them wisdom and guidance about how they should live their life and how they should raise those little blessings. And I'm telling you that there's no one that knows better than God and in His Word. That there's no one. There's no better instruction that you and I are going to get as parents or grandparents. And I know some of you are not, you don't have families yet and all those, but I want, I want you need to hear this also because it's much better for you to make the decision about how you're going to raise the children that God gives to you eventually one day, if that's the path that God has for you. You're going to make that decision now, or it's best to make that decision now, because you're going to be pressured to make other decisions later when those blessings do come. And that can be dangerous if you haven't decided yet what to do. By the way, I would also say another reason why I never would hesitate to preach a message like this because not everybody has a family or not everybody has children. But I want you to understand that the philosophy of our church is to instruct our little ones, as we just witnessed here today, in the ways of the Lord. Now, it is not our job to raise children. That's a good spot for an amen. It's not our job to do that. It is your job as their parent to raise them to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. What is the role of the church? The role of the church and the Sunday school teacher and the children's church worker and, and all of those folks who would come alongside the parents and say, parents, we're with you. We want to help you. We want to uh, uh, back up what you are doing at home. That's important because if you're not doing it at home, can I just be very plain? They're not going to get it in a 40-minute lesson. No, not, it's not going to happen. Well, I had my kids in church, and look how they turned out. Excuse me. Excuse me. Don't blame someone else for decisions that you have made to not raise your children and nurture and admonition of the Lord. Don't do that. All that is is pride and selfishness. And you're looking to blame somebody else. By the way, I think that's what blaming somebody else always is. Can't get along with your spouse. It's their fault. You have pride. The Bible says, only by pride cometh contention. You fight and you complain and you get mad and angry. You have pride. It's the same thing with your kids. Those little blessings that you think would never, oh, they would never do anything wrong. Baloney, they would not. We're going to read a verse here in just a second that says, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. 
Foolishness is bound in their heart. And yet we would side with a little child who would never lie. They would never, they would never say something to get out of being in trouble. Really? Really? Because you do. What you're saying when you blame somebody else is you're lying about what your involvement has been and you're trying to get somebody else in trouble and put the blame off of you. Oh, I know, that's another sermon for another day and you're trying to get me off track. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to try to stick to what I have for the day. Now, the truth of the matter here is that the influencing of our children takes place through what I would call thousands of moments, thousands of interactions that you as their parent will have in the 18 or so years while they're at home. I'm talking like um, those little interactions on a daily basis when they come home from school, um, when they come home from a church service, when they come home from a sporting event, or you know, you, you bring them home from whatever recital, whatever it is that, that they are at, or, or in just those times when you're sitting together around the kitchen table, or, or you're, you're having a meal together, you're, you're in the car headed somewhere, maybe for the holiday or on vacation. All of those little times, those thousands of times, are all opportunities for you to influence those little children for you to help them and speak to them and, and give them truth and, and affirm them and, and encourage them and strengthen them. Now, some of the influences that I'm talking about will be um, what we might call accidental. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, well, uh, dad loses his temper and he begins to raise his voice and yell and scream and get angry and little one sees that. That's an influence. By the way, they're learning from that. Uh, here's another accidental on the other side. When a husband grabs, well, doesn't grab her. I mean, I'm not trying to be weird. But just he gives his wife a kiss and, and a hug and just embraces. And that little one learns it is good for a spouse to love the other spouse. Those are kind of accidental things that, that you know, they, they catch dad or mom reading their Bible, <laughs> or praying. Those are all accidental times when we, we are giving influence to our children. But there are also times that we might call intentional times, such as when, when dad takes a Bible and, and he opens it up, and there's just a brief time of devotions maybe. We're not talking about preaching a sermon. But you, you bring them around, and you, you, you read maybe one verse, and you, you talk about, here's what that means, and here's why it's important, and here's why our family is, is, is wanting to do what God says, because God knows what is best for us. Those intentional times, maybe when, when, when mom makes some plans and gathers a lunch together and just, you know, takes out to the park or, or to the museum or, or just making memories, those kind of things are intentional influences. So you understand there's thousands of times when, when you and I are influencing our, our children or our grandchildren or those, those children around us. We might even think in the, in the hallway as before Sunday school class starts and the, the Sunday school teacher is, is mad or frustrated about something and they got a mean look on their face, guess what, you're influencing you're influencing. Or you walk and you're just, you're happy in the Lord and you got a smile on your face and you're glad to see that, per, that little one and, and man, I don't know what happened in your life but you just, God is helping you and, and you're glad about it and you, you have a smile and you just, you're cheerful and guess what? You're influencing. You're influencing. All of those times that we don't necessarily always think about, we are, we are giving influence to our children. And I'm not talking about just the little, little ones. I'm talking about uh, the ones who are preteen, those teenagers. I would also say that we as older adults are influencing those who are of college age in our congregation. And sad to say, sometimes they can, uh, they've lived long enough and have a little bit of experience, they can kind of see through some, some fake emotion. Yeah, and so we, we can fake it with the little ones, and we think we're getting away with, um, you know, making it sure every, everybody thinks I'm doing okay. And sometimes the people that we're influencing know better than that. Well, how are we influencing those things? And so in all of this, whether it's intentional or accidental influence, 
in all of these things, every single minute of our lives together will be influential in the heart of that child. I'm talking about how I speak to someone on the phone will influence my children. How my attitude is as I'm, I know this one hurts, as I'm in traffic will influence my children. How I welcome guests into the home or as I reject people from getting close. All of those things influence our children. And so how do you make those moments count? How, how do you take full advantage of those, those opportunities? In the few years of life that you have together, how do you teach them uh, of your love for them individually? How, how, how do I teach that little one, I, I love you and I care about you and I want what is absolutely best for you? How do you do that? How do you teach them Christian values and a proper frame of morality that, that will not just be for the, the childhood years, but will help them as they trans they transfer into adulthood how do I make that stick in their life and and as we kind of think about adulthood I just want to reiterate that the goal of our parenting is not so that we will raise children that will behave in church and not run that's a behavior and we should have good behavior I'm not excusing well let them just run around everywhere they want to go that's not what I'm saying but sometimes as parents, especially in our circle, which is a little bit more conservative, we might say a lot more conservative, we, we have done a poor job of just focusing on the behavior and not dealing with the heart issue of the matter. And what the Bible is teaching is that it's the heart that matters. If the heart's right, the behavior is going to be right. The problem also becomes that little Johnny or Susie embarrassed me by how they acted, and so now I'm going to yell at them, scream and spit, and I'm going to beat them. You have a problem then, and you're sinning. We would never condone any of that. But the goal is not just a change of behavior. The goal in parenting, according to what the Bible says, is that I am taking those blessings... That, that God has given to me. By the way, if I believe what the Bible says, then those children aren't necessarily mine. Those are God's children. And how dare I step in front and say, no, no, this is what I think you ought to do. Excuse me. You ask the Lord before you do anything with his children. You follow what his word says before you go your own way in raising your children. They're his. He's given them to you to be a steward so that you can see them come into adulthood. The goal of childhood is not, well, they got on the honor roll and they got, you know, the, on the president's list and they got, you know, I got a little bumper sticker that says, boy, they behave this month. Praise the Lord. <laughs> no, no. It's so that when they become adults, they have chosen themselves to take the faith that you have tried to instill in them and pour into them when they rise up and as they're, they're sitting and while they're walking by the way and when they're lying down. They, when they get to be the adult, they say, that's not just my parents' faith. That's not just my grandmother's faith. That's my faith. That's the goal of parenting. And so they, they get to the point when they become an adult and, and we push them out of the nest, so to speak. And by the way, that's part of the training is the out of the nest. <laughs> Sometimes we influence and we think, oh, no, don't leave. And we never have taught them how to behave themselves out in that world. And then they, they get out and it's like, oh, man, now what's going to happen? And there's a, there's a worry or a concern. Oh, man, it's too late. <laughs> and what I'm begging you to think of is, Take advantage of those moments today. Today, Sunday school teacher. Today, youth worker. Today, college and career teacher. Today, congregant. Today, parent. Today, grandparent. Take advantage today of every one of those opportunities. 
It is my goal to, to, to raise my children to, to trust in the Lord for salvation. That is the, the best decision they will ever make in their life. And then as they grow in that, that they will honor the Lord, that they will yield to the Lord with their lives and with their own families, we are raising them to be adults who honor the Lord and who live for him. And so as you think then, to use that phrase that we started with, as you think about the world in which we live, there are thousands of influences who are competing with you to get at the heart of your child. Thousands of them. I would also say they're not just fighting for the influences of the children. They're fighting for the influences of mom and dad. If we can get to the children, great. We also would like to get to the parents so that they will also help us to influence the children. I read something this week, and, and many of you know about what the, our own Austin School District has, has brought into curriculum for this coming year. It's, just, it's appalling what, what some of these things are that are coming into the school system. And, and please, don't misunderstand. I'm not railing on public education, I, but I do think we need to be aware Teachers have said, have said, parents don't know what is best. The school system, a government-run school system, knows what is best for these children. And parents ought not have a say in what we teach them. Excuse me? I have a problem with that because God has a problem with that. And we wonder... Why we are in the state that we're in. And we can complain and moan all that we want about young people in the world today. But I'm telling you, it is because the influences that have been in their life for seven, eight hours a day. And we think that a five minute devotion at the end of the day is going to do it. Or we, we say, well, the Sunday school teacher and the youth pastor, they didn't help me. And, and look at them now. And I blame them. Excuse me. You have asked someone to pour all of their wisdom, their way of doing things, into your child. And then you expect they're just going to turn out great. And the Bible says, no, no, that's the parent's job. That's your job, mom and dad. So how do we turn their attention away from the harmful influences and toward the Lord Jesus Christ? And why should we do this? Thank you for asking. 2 Timothy chapter number 3 gives us some of those answers. And where we're going to start is with the why. And we're starting with the why because the why answers toward motivation. All right? Here's why we should do these things. So, so in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, what is going on here is Paul is reminding Timothy of the godly influence of a parent and a grandparent in Timothy's own life. But before he does this, what does he do? He gives Timothy a warning and answers, again, this why question of the matter of influence. Timothy, here's why this is important. Here's thought number one. And again, no outline, just, just thinking with me, just uh, some thoughts here. First of all, why should we do this? Why should we fight for influence? Because godly people are going to suffer. Godly people are going to suffer. And what do you mean by that? If I teach my children that it is right to live in a certain way, then what God has said in his word, in fact, it's in 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 12. Here's what Paul says. Yea, and, excuse me, how much? How many? All. Does that include you? <laughs> if you're living godly, ooh, that was quiet, yeah. Sometimes we think, well, you know, I go to church and so they're against me. No, no, this says living godly. Don't feel sorry for yourself if you think you're suffering persecution and you're not living godly. That's not what we're talking about here. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So you're telling me that if I teach my little blessings to live godly, they're going to go through tough and difficult times and they're going to suffer persecution? I'm not telling you that. God is. So why wouldn't you prepare them if living godly is right? And hopefully we would all agree, yes, it is right. Then we ought to also prepare them for what might be coming for them also. 
persecution very might well be coming. Now, in the country in which we live, let's be honest. We are not suffering a whole lot of persecution. I know there are ungodly influences. I know there are things that, oh man, you know, we, we can't go in these places or they're, they're taking the prayer out of schools. And to me, I just want to ask, were you praying with your child before they took prayer out of schools? I know, again, a quiet, yeah. See, the problem, we, we like to blame a lot of other things and we, the problem lies with us. And so what Paul is saying is, listen, Timothy, it is important that you understand that if you take a stand for your God in the day and time in which you live, first century A.D., not 2019, first century, if you take a stand in the day and time in which you live, there's going to come some persecution. You try to stand against an ungodly influence in the life of your child, there's going to be people that stand against you. And if your child does that, there are going to be people that stand against your child. You need to prepare them for that. Just help them to be ready. By the way, do they have someone that they can turn to for help that is a shield and a buckler to them? Oh, yeah, Almighty God. Their Heavenly Father can care for them much better than you can. Well, I don't want my child to go to the mission field because then I won't ever see them. And they'll, they'll, I'm sure they'll be called to Africa and they'll get all kinds of diseases. Excuse me. Your heavenly father loves them better than you do. He can take care of them. You don't worry about his plan. You encourage his plan in their life. Good gravy. I just, I, I don't, under, if I had hair. Those children that God gives, they are blessings. They are God's gift to you. The fruit of the womb is his reward. And sometimes I wonder if the, the reason why it doesn't seem like that is because I haven't acted like they are his reward to me. I act at times like they can be a nuisance or a frustration. And guess what I am influencing in the mind of my child? Can't wait till I get out of here and then I won't have to be a problem. Can't wait to get out of here and then I won't have to do what they say and won't have to be under their thumb. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be. But what, how am I influencing? I, I need to understand, first of all, godly people will suffer. And, and so what our children need to see in us is an unwavering love for our God and a commitment to stand for what is right, for what is true, regardless of the suffering that might come as a result of that. And then Paul says this, here's why you need to take some importance or understand the importance of this, not only because godly people are going to suffer, but secondly, because the nature of what the alternative influence is. What's that? Look at verse number 13. Here's the alternative influence. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, we oftentimes think about this passage in, in the light of the end times or the end days. And certainly we understand from verse number 1 of chapter number 3 that, that Paul is, is emphasizing those last days and perilous times are going to come. We don't always think of it in the light of parenting or in the, the uh, context of raising children. But if we read verses 14 and 15, that's exactly where Paul, or where Paul has inserted that into the life of Timothy in the context of a child rearing, a raising, and Tim, Paul is bringing Timothy back to his very own raising. It is important in this matter of, of raising a child, of nurturing that child, of bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, that you need to understand that, that persecution is coming. Teach them to stand with their God. And there is an alternative that is unacceptable. We, we, we would never, we would never Ask for an evil man and a seducer to babysit our kids. We would never ask for that. But what influence are we allowing in their life? Are we allowing evil men and seducers to wax worse and worse? Are we allowing the culture of all our day to infiltrate them? Now, we might not invite them in our home in person, but we got a box. We got a, something that plays some music. Uh, we give them 
a little box. Are you saying we should take everything away? Let's not jump to conclusions here. Let's just be wise with what we do. Because um, most televisions now have a little, little thing that comes with it, a wand or a click or a remote or whatever you call it in your house. And it has a power button. It has a channel up and a channel down. If you don't have a clicker, that's what God gave you kids for. <laughs> Go push the button. It's a joke. Any of you a remote in your household growing up? Change the... There used to be a TV and you had a dial. Do you know any of this? You have antennas that came out and you had to stand there, you know, and kind of while the game came on. All right. So, so Paul is, is using this context of Timothy's own upbringing and influence. And so what does he say? Verse 14. Okay, Timothy, verse 12. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Evil men and shall wax worse and worse. But notice verse 14. But you, Timothy... You continue. You, you keep going. Keep going in what? You continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known, what is it that he has known? The Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scriptures. Which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You, Timothy, you continue in these things. And, and this, this matter of, of guarding our children, that, that is an, a responsibility of us as their parents, is more than just teaching them, hey, don't, don't talk to strangers. It's more than just, hey, don't give out your information on social media. Just you don't, don't do that. Don't get caught in those chat rooms. It's more than those things. It is teaching them to guard themselves from marketing and media and music and all other forms of popular culture that, let's just be honest, have a definite agenda for your children. They have an agenda. Do you know why... And I, Please forgive me, I'm going to wrap this up, but I just want to be very plain. Do you know why drag queens want to be inserted into public schools? Because they have to recruit, they don't reproduce. They're just gaining recruits. And you read some of the, the stuff that I have been reading, and they want to start it at kindergarten. And before that, that's ah, going to be okay. You know, they, they need to be a light in a dark place. Excuse me, I agree with that wholeheartedly. But are you teaching them to be the light at home? Or are you just kind of allowing them to be fostered into the culture? Well, that's how we be a light, is we just be a part in that. No, that's not what the Bible says. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, excuse me, what? Holy, acceptable unto God. Why? That's your reasonable service. What's the next verse? Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, these young people, some of them are homeschooled, some of them go to private school, some of them go to public school. I'm telling you this, and I'm going to make it very public, as I usually do. I am proud of every single one of them. I'm grateful for them. I'm telling you, I pray for them. I pray for their parents. Because there are people that want to destroy their life. I mean, just destroy it. They don't love them. They're not looking to give them more freedom. They're looking to gain them to their side. Why? Because we got to recruit the next generation. Come on with us. We'll give you freedom. We'll give you liberty. You won't have to stay in that stodgy old church. All they do is tell you what to do and what not to do. Excuse me, all we're trying to do is encourage them with God's word. Because we know that's what's best. And so they sing up here and Micah Harden makes a big old circle. 
I love that. When they're sitting here hugging themselves because they're picturing what Jesus does to them. He's their friend. They can rely on him. Young people, I want you to understand. The reason why boundaries are set. Mom and dad, I want you to understand. The reason why we would be so in stress setting boundaries is because we do love them. I don't want you to be out there and just walking as close to the line as you can or even sometimes stepping over. No, no, I want you as far away from the line as you can. Don't even go near that. It's time to go. I didn't get past the first page, so we're going to continue this next Sunday. But I, parents, I want you to understand, we are for you. We are with you. We are praying for you. But you must do your part. There is a, an ungodly, satanic influence out in the world today. And by the way, it's not just because it's 2019. It's happened, again, ever since the fall. Excuse me, what did the children sing about? Babel, Babel, Babel. That is all the way in Genesis 11. Boy, we didn't get very far, and already men are saying, no, no, we're the ones you need to be listening to. Foolishness, foolishness. It happened then, it happened in the past, it happened when you were a kid, it's happening now. Let's be praying for our young people, praying for our parents and grandparents, praying for one another, help one another. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. It's so